Well, hello and welcome to today's Bible reading and devotional. This is for Thursday, August the 10th. Let me adjust the microphone just a little. Uh, Thursday, August the 10th, 2023. Thank you for joining me. Uh, if you want to get your Bibles out, we'll be starting in uh, Psalm 26 and then go to Psalm 84. We'll have a reading out of 2 Samuel 16 and then Luke chapter 6 beginning in verse 17 generated by the kingdom bible reading plan uh by logos which i don't get any kind of compensation or any endorsement fee that just happens to be the bible program that i use along with bible soft which is what you see on the screen in the new king james version uh, as we're reading and don't forget to hit that subscribe bar and then when the notification bell pops up click on it so you can be notified whenever content's added to the channel and you know what to do about commenting liking and sharing the videos so let me get the right uh, passage over here on the monitor and then uh, while you're turning to your uh to uh, psalm 26 and while you're subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell i am going to go into my usual postage stamp and if you're new to the program well, there, I should be in the upper right-hand corner, right where the postage stamp would go on an envelope. Okay, Psalm 26, a prayer for divine scrutiny and redemption, a Psalm of David. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. I have also trusted in the Lord. I shall not slip. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with idolatrous mortals, nor will I go in with hypocrites. I have hated the assembly of evildoers, and will not sit with the wicked. I will wash my hands in innocence, so I will go about your altar, O Lord, that I may proclaim with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all your wondrous works. Lord, I have loved the habitation of your house and the place of your glory uh, and the place where your glory dwells. Do not gather my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men, in whose hands is a sinister scheme, and whose right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be merciful to me. My foot stands in an even place in the congregations. I will bless the Lord. So now we'll go to Psalm 85. Psalm 85, a prayer that the Lord will restore the favor to the land, to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us, O God, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth, and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and shall make his footsteps our pathway. Second Samuel 16. Now this is one I'm really going to stumble over. Mephshebeth. I got laughed at by this old guy one time. He was in his seven. I think he's about 80 now. And he liked to make fun of me because I couldn't pronounce this. So whenever I got to it, I would just say, uh, Dwight, and I'd point to him and he'd say it just, just on cue. Uh, so, you know, I, I might stumble on it. In fact, I will stumble on it. So when David was a little past the top of the mountain, there was Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, Meth who met him with a couple of saddled donkeys, and on the two, and on them two hundred loaves of bread, one hundred clusters of raisins, one hundred summer fruits, and a skin of wine. And the king said to Ziba, What do you mean to do with these? 
So Ziba said, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for those who are faint in the wilderness to drink. And the king said, where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is staying in Jerusalem, for he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. So the king said to Ziba, here, all that belongs to Mith, 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 Mith is yours. And Ziba said, I humbly bow before you that I may find favor in your sight, O my lord, O king. Now when King David came to uh, Bahariam, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul, whose name was uh, Shemaiah, the son of Gera. Coming from there, he came out cursing continuously as he came, and he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David. And all the people and all the mighty men who were on his right hand and on his left. So Shemai said thus when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. So now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. Then Ab Abishai, the son of Zerah, said to the king, why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please let me go over and take off his head. See, they were pretty loyal to their kings in those days. And I chuckle a little. I should know that was inappropriate. But, you know, the, the you know why should this dead dog? Hey, let me go kill him, basically, is what he's saying. It's what he wants to do. Is let me go over and kill this guy because he's insulting you. You're my king, and I'm a loyal servant of yours. So let me go just take care of him. But David, remember, man after God's own heart, David is, yeah, he fought wars, but he's not this bloodthirsty tyrant that this uh, guy uh, 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 is making him out to be. Look at verse 10. The king said, what have I to do with you, the sons of Zariah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, curse David, who then shall say, why have you done so? And David said to uh, Abishai and all his servants, See how my son who came from my own body seeks my life. How much more may this uh, Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. It may be that the Lord will look upon my affliction, and that the Lord will repay me with good for cursing, uh, for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went along the road, Shemaiah went along the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and kicked up dust. Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel was with them. And so it was when Hushiah the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king, and long live the king. So Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go to your friend? And Hushiah said to Absalom, No, but whom the Lord and his people and all the men of Israel choose, his I will be, uh, and with him I will remain. He's kind of letting others make his decision for him. Furthermore, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? As I have served in your presence, so will I be in your presence. Then Absalom said to uh, Ahathophel, give advice as to what we should do. And Ahathophel said to Absalom, go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. And all Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father, then the hands of all those who are with you will be strong. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now the advice of Ahathophel which he gave in, in those days, was as if he had uh, inquired at the oracle of God. So was all the advice of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. Now, he's fleeing Jerusalem. David meant by these uh, few remaining links to the house of Saul, professing a loyalty to the king, uh, one of them did, and the other is obviously abusing him, is not, not a fan, we could say throwing stones at David and his officials. Uh, and this uh, relative of Saul, we see a lesson here. Some think of God's chastisement. Look at the cursing and the abuse that uh, Shemai has on David uh, as he's coming through and throwing all the rocks at him and that kind of thing. 
calling him, you know, a scoundrel, immoral man. And depending on how your translation reads, those words may vary a little bit. Shouting out at David uh, that he's being judged by God, repaying David for his sins. But notice his restraint. David was showing a lot of restraint here. I don't know if I could have been that, uh, shown that kind of restraint. And I know th from history, there are people, kings and dictators, who once the offer was made, hey, let me go kill that guy. All right, go, take him out. But David is looking at it different. Um, and this is David's uh, uh, nephew that's wanting to retaliate and go after him. Uh, David's uh, one brother is mentioned back in 1 Samuel. Uh, I don't think we see much more of his brothers. Uh, the one person I've often wondered about is David's mother. We don't read anything about her. Uh, and what kind of mother she had, just when David comes on the scene, it's his father and his brothers. Maybe she's dead by that time. I, I don't know. So look at the restraint. And sometimes, you know, David's just saying, okay, let it go. You know, this is what the Lord wants and, and the Lord is allowing this. Just let it go. Sometimes we get into those situations. We need to be more like the David. We may want to go and, and send somebody. Yeah, go take them out or go ourselves. And do something but exercising restraint is typically going to be the better decision because you know once you say something or do something that's it you know it's the old uh, toothpaste is out of the tube genies out of the bottle and trying to put it back in is very difficult and is something is is that you know advice that mama told me uh you know sleep on it you know i've written some nasty letters and i know people have written nasty letters or wanted to say something and Oh, so they think about it, they go home, they sleep on it, maybe they don't sleep very well, and they toss and turn, but then they get up the next day and they think, you know, I've cooled off. Yeah, what he said was was insulting, it was bad, it was this, it was that. But if I had said what I was thinking at the time, it would have made a bad situation worse. Yeah, maybe I just need to let it go. Or maybe I'll write a letter and then burn the letter or something like that, however you want to deal with it. But always stop it and think very rarely have i kept my mouth shut and regretted it uh, there are a lot of times i've opened my mouth and said something or did something and then later thought oh no why did i do that? and there are a lot more of those times and there are the times that i was quiet and and uh, I, there are a lot more times i shot my mouth off and regretted it than there are times i kept quiet and and didn't regret it or rather kept quiet and regretted it we got that backwards. Okay. So our last reading now will be in Luke chapter 6. I was just noticing how short these readings are today. They are not as long as sometimes. Oh, the coffee mug today. Um, the top 10 ways to act like you talk. You, I can't do it. <laughs> talk Baston. I'm not very good with Northeast accents. We were in, in Boston several years ago, and I got this mug uh, at a gift shop. I think it was by the Old North Church. I don't remember. Uh, and so, yeah, it's got different ways here. You know, ride a swan in the public gardens. I, we were there in December, right as the winter solstice hit. It was freezing. Uh, and there's a song that says, uh, I've never been to Boston in the fall. Yeah, I've been there, but it crossed over into winter and it felt like winter the whole time. Winds were high and that sort of thing. You know, pack your cat at, at, um, at Harvard Yard, you know. Uh, we had a guy, he was a student at MIT, I was speaking at a church there, a student at MIT who took a day off of his classes to show us around. I wanted to go to the campus and just so I could walk on and say, hey, I've been to MIT, but didn't get to do that. Okay, Luke chapter 6, where Jesus is uh, going to start it off by uh, healing a great multitude of people. And he came down, verse 17 is where we're starting. Luke 6, verse 17, And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits as they were healed, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Now, in uh, Luke chapter 6, verse 20, begins what many call the Sermon on the Plain, which is a kind of an abbreviation of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew uh, chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7. Now, remember, this is a different setting. It's a different place. So you can't expect it to be word for word what he said uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. 
and a lot of people point to this and the differences and make a big deal about it, but it's it's a different audience. It's a different setting. So don't get too worked up over things like that. Uh, okay, verse 20. He lifted up his eyes towards his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil, for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy. For indeed your reward is great in heaven, for in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you who, when men uh, all when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers of the false prophets. Now you notice he's not saying it's bad or it's a sin to be wealthy or to have enough to eat, but you can get comfortable in those in those situations. Woe to you who are rich because I'm rich. I'm like the rich man in, in the in the rich man in Lazarus, which I don't think was a parable. I think it was a real thing, but that's another discussion when we get to it. We'll talk about that. Um, but, you know, the rich can sometimes get let it go to their heads. That I've got money. I can buy whatever I want, go anywhere, do anything. And you, you do need to think about those who need help and are less fortunate. And we, uh, as Christians, should help out. Now, I'm not a millionaire. But if I can help out someone who's less fortunate than me, then yeah, I typically do it. There are some times that I don't, and that's, again, another discussion for another time. So now he's coming into the part where in Matthew chapter 5, he talks about loving our enemies. I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do, do, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also, and from him who... Uh, uh, takes away your cloak, or do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Just as you want men to do to you, so also do to them likewise. That's what we call the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Now notice in here, yeah, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. He doesn't say anything about affirming lifestyles or affirming sin or accepting uh, uh, enemies and, and their their actions. Because an enemy is probably going to be doing stuff to try and hurt you. So it doesn't mean that I have to say, well, yeah, that's okay, or your sin is okay. No, it, that's not how any of this works. But then he goes on to say, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit uh, is that to you for even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back now here's where it's a little bit off track but uh lending credit money those are that's probably the biggest divide between people uh your, your relative comes to you hey i can't make the rent can you loan me a thousand dollars five hundred dollars whatever the rent is yeah sure no problem okay i'll pay it back i'll pay it back and then they don't pay you back Hey, then when are you going to pay me back that money? When are you going to pay me? Oh, I'll pay I'll pay it. Oh, you're so greedy about it. And it becomes problems. So the general rule I try to do is I don't lend money. I'll just, if you you know need rent help, uh, help with your rent or your groceries, who's the landlord? I'll just pay it to him or I'll pay what I can to him. And then I just kiss the money goodbye. If you can pay me back, fine. If not, uh, down the road, just remember someone helped you out when you were in need and just, you know, pay it forward, I guess is what, what the expression I'm looking for. Uh, help out somebody down the road if you can't pay it back. Uh, so, uh, but what, let's see, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For sinners do the same. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit uh, is that to you? Even sinners do the same. But if you, and he goes on in verse 32, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies, do good, and lend hoping for nothing in return. 
and your reward will be great, and you're, you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil, therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. You know, I live in an area where there's a lot of farmers around us. And when it rains, who gets the rain? Well, the Christian farmer and then the heathen farmer across the street gets the rain. They both benefit. They benefit from a good price for their crops. Both of them do. So God's really blessing both of them. He might bless the sinner to coax him, not coax him, that's the wrong word, to get him thinking about where these blessings come from. The Christian is blessed because he's faithful to God. So God's blessing them, but for different reasons in each case. And then verse 37, do not or judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Okay, this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, are probably two of the most, I would say, two the most abused and misapplied and misquoted passages in the Bible. He is not saying that judgment is wrong. If you see sin and you call it out, hey, that sin, that's the judgment's been done. There is no judging to be done there. You're just saying what God has already said. But you've got to be careful. You don't want to be harping on your kid to quit smoking while you're lighting up. Or don't you ever drink, kid, because uh, that's a bad thing while you're you're drinking. You know, you want to be careful there. Now, if you are a parent like I am, and you realize that you did make sure no kids are around, we all did stupid stuff when we were teenagers and in our 20s. I fortunately did mine before the internet came along, so there's not that many records of it. I've got plausible deniability. Um, but it is not hypocritical for me to sit down with my daughter and say, look, don't do X, Y, or Z. Uh, but dad, didn't you do Z? Yeah, I did. It was a mistake. It was wrong. It was sin. It was whatever. It's not being hypocritical to tell your kid not to do the things that you did. Uh, you just uh, need to make sure you do it uh, and present it in a right way so they know you're doing it out of love, that you really want what's best for them, and not uh, you're doing it because you're some uh, dictator that's lording it over them. Uh, verse 39, he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men who do not, for men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure will bring forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasures will bring forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, I can't tell, and I use this all the time, I can't tell a pear tree from an apple tree from an orange tree. Okay, if I'm driving down the road, they're just trees. But I get out of the car and I walk up to it. Okay, that's an orange growing there. So that must be an orange tree. I know what an apple looks like. I know what pears look like. So by the fruit, I know the tree. So if a Christian, you should see Christian. And remember, it's biblical definition, not my politics uh, or your politics. Well, what does the Bible say? And that's how we tell if the fruit is good or not, is are they doing what the Bible uh, says? And, you know, if you look at my two cents worth segments, I, I go into some more details on some of this. And then verse 46, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. Uh, when I see these progressive Christians running around, that's what they call themselves, and they are not building on the teachings of Jesus. They pretend they are. They have a little garnishment uh, on their uh, beliefs and on their life to make it look Christian. Uh, but they, they basically grab onto the love your neighbor, uh, and that's about it. They don't get into the fact that you need to follow Jesus to be a, uh, to, to 
be pleasing to God. They don't uh, look at the fact that the Bible is the word of God most of the time. A lot of them reject it. And I've seen uh, some of them, well, Paul made a mistake here, or or, or Jesus didn't say that, or, or they, they do things like that. They're not building on the rock. Now, conversely, you can go too far the other way and be like a Pharisee, and you're really not building either. So let's find the middle ground. Let's find the area where we can uh, not stray to the right or to the left and build on the foundation that Jesus is, has given us. Okay, and that's the end of our readings for today. So as we usually do, we will close out uh, in prayer. So for today, Thursday, our prayer topics are for the nation, pray for our elected officials, and uh, efforts to bring peace and righteousness. And yes, pray for the elected officials, even if you voted for the other guy or for the other party, okay? He did say to vote uh, to pray for them only if you like them. But remember to pray for them. And I should maybe one day we'll talk a little bit more about why we need to do that. Okay, so let's go to God in prayer. We're thankful, Lord, for the avenue of prayer. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all the things that you provide. And at this time, we want to lift up our nation, Lord. Our nation is divided. Our nation is going down the wrong path. And we want to pray, Lord, that Christians will stand for your truth, that we will be bold like the apostles were. We will speak your truth. We will do it in a loving way, but we will just confront sin and confront error. We want to pray for our leaders, for our president, for our our uh, congressmen, our senators, the judicial branch, and help them, Lord, to make righteous decisions, decisions, decisions that are based on the truth of your word, so that we may lead that quiet and peaceable life that uh, Paul told Timothy we need to be leading. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be involved in our process as Christians. Help us, Lord, to share the gospel in our life and in our words. We pray, Lord, for righteousness and peace to be brought to our nation, that it will be a nation that is that is going to be good, and because it is it is a righteous and, and loving nation, help us to build on those principles, Lord. Help us to build on your word. Help us to bring the freedom and the truth of the gospel. We pray for forgiveness of our own sins. Pray, Lord, you'll help us to always walk in your light, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That's going to wrap it up for today. Thank you for being here. And don't forget, if you have questions, you can leave them in the comment section below or send them to me, 2timothy4.2.3 at gmail.com. And I will get on it. You need to allow about six or eight weeks or so for delivery. I might do a sermon on it. I might do a brief minute message. I might do a uh, my two cents worth. Uh, it, you'll get an answer. The answer might be, I don't know. Uh, and it'll depend on my knowledge of the subject and what you're asking and that sort of thing and what resources I have. So that's it for today. Have a great Thursday, and uh, we will see you in the next video. I'm out.